God's kind of husband is also gentle. Does that mean he's not tough? Some of the gentlest people that exist are people who are tough, but they know how to control their toughness in the right context. So what he does is he respects his wife and shows her honor. Now, let's understand something about this passage here. Uh, Many people misunderstand this. It says, she is someone weaker since she's a woman in verse 7. And people say, ah, ah, weaker, weaker. So, So Peter didn't have a nice understanding of what a woman is. This actually means not weaker, but in the sense of being something that is treasured. So not physically weaker, not of a lesser value, but actually of great value. I, uh, when I was a kid, I liked to collect comic books. Uh, I still do from time to time. It, it's a hobby. Some of the older ones and things like that. So my dad knows that I like those things. He, he loves to collect antiques. Um, I never liked that, but I did collect comic books. So he knows antiques. He doesn't know comic books. One day, he brought home a sack of comics and threw them on the floor in my room. He said, I got you some comics today when I got some antiques. He just threw them on the floor. You know, they don't mean anything to him. And so I said, oh, what is it? And he said, just some old comics. And I started pulling them out, and he had bought 11 1939 Superman comics for a dollar each. And I said, Dad, do you know what these are? Yeah, they're Superman comics. I said, do you know what they are? Yeah, they're Superman comics. Dad, do you, do you know that 1939 Superman comics are um, pretty valuable? They were in pretty bad shape, so they weren't as valuable as they could have been. And he said, let me see those. And, 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 and I didn't see them again. He, he took them back. So he let me have one. He let me have one. Um, uh, so the thing is, just threw them in the room. They didn't mean anything to him. But then when I told him, you know, these are somewhat valuable, he got the bag. He kind of cradled it like almost like it was a baby and took it out of the room and then put it in a safe place where, where they would not be damaged. And so that's really what the point is here. Treating your wife as something valuable. In the ancient world, the idea would be a precious vase. You know, a vase that is expensive, that's immaculate, is beautiful, it's taken a lot of time to put together, it has precious materials in it, and people don't just throw those around, they take good care of those. And so that's what this means. Husbands, our responsibility is to treat our wives as valuable, as precious. Not weak in the sense of, of being fragile, but in the sense of being very precious and being a priority in our lives. God's kind of husband also is a leader. So husbands should lead. Sometimes in marriages, um, some challenges come because husbands won't lead, so the wife feels like she needs to take the will. Sometimes husbands are domineering and do not biblically respond to issues in the marriage. So true leadership is serving, as we saw earlier, and not only that, it is Love, Because if we really love our wives as Christ loved the church and we're willing to give ourselves for our wives like Christ gave himself for us, that takes care of many marriage problems. Takes care of many marriage problems. An interesting verse in verse 7. We're working toward the end of this passage. But it tells us that God's kind of husband honors his wife. And so we see, first of all, that she's a fellow heir of grace. Same salvation, same Lord, same faith, same Holy Spirit who lives within. And then Peter says, you treat her the way that you ought to treat her so that your prayers will not be hindered. Wow. You mean if I'm not a godly husband, it can hinder my prayers? That's what it says here. If I don't have a good relationship with my wife, I do not have a good relationship with God at the moment. And I do not have a good prayer life. I have a hindered prayer life. It's almost like these things are tied together, right? Well, they are. The Ten Commandments boil down into loving God and loving others, and those two things are tied together. I can't love others well if I don't love God, and if I don't love God, I'm not going to love others the way that I ought to love them. These things are interconnected. 
So, moving toward the last two verses, um, I want to briefly really explain what the breakdown is many times in marriages. And that is, many people just try to do better, they quit doing something cold turkey, and they think that's enough. But if you just take something out of your life, and you quit doing it, you leave a vacuum. That's not a biblical way to deal with something. What you must do is put off the ungodly action and then put something in its place. So you put off the thing that does not honor God and then you put something in its place that does. And so what you see in Scripture over and over again, as you read the Bible, notice this. Take note of this. God says, don't do this, but do this instead. And so there are some put on and some put off actions in this passage. Some things we need to put on, things we need to do, and things we need to not do. What do we need to put on? Harmony. Are husbands and wives different? Yes. Are chords on a keyboard different? Yeah. But if you have several notes that are playing together, if you're playing the right notes together, you have harmony. They actually complement each other. They're different, but they harmonize. So one thing to do is to put on harmony in a marriage. How can I work toward peace? This isn't about me getting my way. This isn't about me showing who's boss. How can we have the type of harmony that we need to have? And sometimes that means listening. We don't listen. Uh, Sometimes the other person's talking and we're already formulating a response and we don't even listen to what they say because we're thinking about what we want to say and we don't listen well. Sympathy. You know, a husband might be tired after coming home from work. Uh, might a wife be tired after wrangling with three children and one just insists that the diaper goes on the head and not somewhere else and is running around and then breaks out of the house and this happens and that happened? M- might it be tiring to be a husband and a wife? Both? Yes. And so we need to understand the horrible when somebody says, well, hey, I work for a living. Well, you know, people work no matter what they do. So sympathy, understanding. Also remembering we're fellow, fellow, fellow believers in Christ and being kind-hearted. What can I do to love my spouse? And then not necessarily having to say that. Did you see anything different this morning? Did, did you see anything maybe that I might have done for you, not just for bragging rights or for points, but to do it because we want to do it? Okay, so those are some of the put on. Put off act, uh, put on actions. Some of the put off actions don't return evil for evil. Yeah, you did that. Well, look what I'm going to do. Oh, you insulted me. Just wait till you hear what I'm going to say. It's so easy if somebody attacks us to want to attack them as well. But the Bible says a soft answer turns away wrath. We need to be peacemakers. So those are the two put-off actions. Don't return evil for evil. Don't return insults for insults. Two more put-on actions, and then we'll have our application. Bless instead of curse. How can I be a blessing to my husband, to my wife? What can I do that honors God that can bless him or her? Why? Because Peter tells us in verse 9 that we will inherit a blessing if we do this. That's the purpose. What have we been called to? It says in verse 9. It says you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. We have been called to be godly husbands and godly wives. And a biblical marriage, a godly marriage, is a blessing in and of itself. It's a blessing to our children. It's a blessing to the community. It is a testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. We, If we sing that God is love and that God brings peace and we don't have peace in our marriages. We're saying one thing, but we're doing another. So we need to make sure that our walk matches what we're saying. Okay, as far as an application, there's some applications I want to say just to tie this up. One thing is, an emphasis from last night as well, there is hope for any marriage that is a marriage where both are believers. Now, why do I say that? Well, if you're in a marriage where the spouse is not a believer, they don't have the capacity to please God and honor God and obey him and do the right thing. You still have a responsibility 
to be an example so that person can see the love of Christ and be saved. But if both of you are believers, you are through the Scripture, through the Holy Spirit, capable of overcoming any problem or becoming stronger than before. Uh, for a couple of years, I was in karate, but, but, but things got busy at school, and I was able uh, for a while to do it, but after that, I couldn't. And uh, here's what the karate instructor said. He said, find the hardest piece of metal you can find and hit it over and over again. And I said, is this some kind of test? Is this like the wax on, wax off in Karate Kid? What, what do you mean? He said, well, what you do is you hit it, and you hit it, and that makes fractures in your bones. And I said, that's exactly what I'm trying not to do by learning karate. And he said, no, you make these micro fractures. I'm not telling you to hit it as hard as you can and break your fist, but you're hitting it in such a way you create these micro fractures, and the bone that heals in its place is actually harder than the original bone, and so it gives you more strength. And I said, are you sure you're not just making this up? He said, um, you want me to show you one of my hits? Just, and I said, no, okay, okay, I believe you. But the point is, something can be broken but then heal in such a way that it was stronger than it was to begin with through Christ. It's possible. Biblical results require biblical solutions. That's number two. Don't go searching on the internet for your marriage problem. Don't be searching on TV or in a lot of the popular books that talk about relationships. Scripture gives us what we need to know. Was Scripture sufficient 2,000 years ago for marriages? Yes, and it still is today. We need to go back to Scripture to find out what Scripture tells us. Number three, a proper perspective is crucial. Most counselees that I talk to, when they come in with marriage problems, the immediate thing they want to do is relief. They want to feel better. It's not about relief. It's about glorifying God. And when we glorify God, we might not feel better right away. Have you ever gone to the doctor, you were sick, and you get a shot or you get some kind of medicine and it's what you need. Things are, are working in your body to heal you, but you don't necessarily feel better to begin with. And so with Scripture, it's not about how we feel. It's about being obedient. First and foremost, glorifying God. Okay. Also, identify your marriage problems. In one message, I can't talk about every problem that you might have what you need to do is identify the actual problem you have and then apply the correct solution to that. And if you are having marriage problems, I encourage you not to just keep it quiet or try to hide it because people will think less of you. What do you call a Christian couple with marriage problems that goes and talks to somebody who has wisdom about marriage? Wise. Nobody's going to look down on you or think that you're some kind of subpar Christian. We are here to help each other and to build each other up. There are people in this church who are equipped to listen to the problems that you have that are going to apply biblical solutions and help you to do that, not just as a quick fix, but to apply it over days and weeks for God's glory as you learn new patterns that please Christ. So... Identifying the problems are very important, just like a surgeon. A surgeon's not going to cut somebody open and then try to figure out what's wrong with them. There's a study that's done first, and then there is the right application. So if you have a kidney stone, they're not going to do any work on your heart and hope that's going to help the kidney stone. You have to apply the problem, and the solution has to be the um, right solution to that. Repent of failures and do not repeat them. That's another thing to remember. We need to repent where we've sinned. Beautiful words to ask a spouse. I've done this, this, this. Will you forgive me? I want to honor Christ and I want to honor you. Will you forgive me? Will you pray for me and help me when I fail to understand that I want to please Christ and I want to honor you? Forgiveness is one of the reasons why many marriages break up. Lack of forgiveness. And so we must have forgiveness in marriages. Really, this morning's message is about a springboard. Foundational. 
problems exist, here are the solutions for those problems, and it's basically a bird's eye view or an overview of marriage problems and issues. I encourage you that if you're facing marriage problems and challenges, uh, to speak with Brother Randy. He has wisdom to help you. He loves you. He loves the Lord. And he can show you what Scripture says. So what we've done is we've just opened the door. But there are many things that could be said that can't be said in one sermon. Or we would be here until tonight and then tomorrow and then the rest of the week if we looked at every specific thing. But I encourage you to honor Christ in your marriage. Seek the help that you need to glorify him. And I promise you, if you do what Scripture says, you will please Christ, and Christ can help any marriage problem. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this morning and for this passage. I pray for the wives who are here that they would be the godly kind of wives they should be, for the husbands that we should be the, we would be the godly kind of husbands that we should be, that we would remember that marriage is about ministry, it's about commitment, and help us to serve the other for your glory. I pray that we would be a light in this world through our marriages, that we would tell others about the hope of Christ, not only with our words, but with our actions and with our marriages. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Dr. Akers, for sharing with us from that passage. Do y'all realize what a controversial and difficult passage that was? You didn't really know it, did you? Because he walked through it so smoothly and just